Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Today's guest is the Director of Governance at the R Street Institute, and he's also written articles for magazines such as Forbes. What's the other two I got here? The Hill and USA Today. Jonathan Bidlack, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it. So I wanted to have you on today to talk about ranked choice voting. I I feel not a lot of people know what it is. I know prior to reading your article and doing some research, I had heard of it, but I really didn't know what it is. So what exactly is ranked choice voting? Sure. Uh, it's a it's a great question. And it's kind of a, become a hot topic of late, I guess you could say. So uh, I guess it's easiest to contrast with what, what many people are, are typically used to, which is you go into the voting booth, you pick a candidate, and that's it, right? And the problem with doing that is that, you know, that doesn't really give us a whole lot of information about how strongly you like that candidate relative to, you know, his or her opponent. And so ranked choice voting is just basically an alternate way where you, instead of going and just picking a candidate that you like best, uh, you basically just go in and rank order them in terms of how you like them. Uh, and the advantage of this is that it gives us a way to uh, essentially have winning candidates uh, win by getting a majority. So uh, I'll give you one example. You know, there was a, a congressional race uh, a couple of years ago down in Georgia where um, in the first round election, it was a it was a primary where there were, you know, I think uh, maybe 15 or even close to 20 candidates on the ballot. And the candidate who took first in that primary had about 19 or 20 percent. And so in those instances, if you don't have a runoff, then that candidate ends up just becoming the representative for that district in effect, because in this case, it was a heavy Republican district. And so um, the idea behind ranked choice voting is that ultimately to be able to move on to the next stage election or to ultimately win in the general election, uh, you should have to get 50 percent. And the way that you do that is by taking the rankings that, that people provide um, and then eliminating that candidate who is the worst performing candidate. And then essentially just reallocating the, the 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 their first choices to who they prefer until one candidate ends up getting ends up getting fifty percent. And so it's a way uh, where where you know I think that um, you remove this sort of strategic incentive that exists in the status quo because you no longer have to go and say, well, I really like this guy best, but the reality is he's not going to win, so therefore I probably need to support this other person instead. And, and so. It provides us with a way, I think, to to uh, get at what is maybe a little bit um, uh, a little bit more buy in in terms of in terms of which candidates ultimately win. OK, so besides the benefit of you have to end up getting more than 50 percent of the vote, what what other anticipated benefits would there be from implementing this system? Yeah, there are a number of things. Um so, so one is that, um, you know, there's some evidence that it makes campaigns themselves a little bit more civil. Uh, you know, if you have this, this situation where you're basically trying to go and turn out your base and that's all that matters, um, it's in your interest to essentially go and oftentimes trash your opponents. But in a ranked choice setting, um, you know, who voters choose as their second or third choice might end up making the difference uh, between whether or not you win that election. And so you end up having a little bit more, I think, um, civility among candidates. I mean, for example, uh, in, in the, the recent uh, Alaska uh, elect congressional election uh, where you had, you know, a, a couple you had essentially two Republicans and one Democrat running, winning, uh, running. And they have those, ranked choice voting in Alaska, right? They did for the first time. Yeah. So at the, at the federal level. Uh, Alaska and Maine are the two states that have have uh, ranked choice, and uh, and Alaska just recently implemented it via via ballot initiative. Um, so one thing you saw was that you know you had in this case you know, two Republicans who were on the ballot, basically you know saying, oh, we're not going to beat up on, a, on each other as much. Um, rank us one and two, and their strategy didn't work, but it changed the nature of that debate, that discussion a little bit. Um, I think the other thing that you that you get is on the voter side. Um, again, you tend to have people being a little bit more bought in to who the eventual nominee is, because even if your favorite candidate doesn't end up winning, um, maybe they were your second favorite candidate. And because you rank them second, you may have actually had an impact on them ultimately becoming your, your representative. Uh, so I think that's useful. The other thing I'll say is that I think that it also changes a little bit the incentives about who decides to run in the first place. 
um, you know, in the current system, we have these sort of primary elections where, you know, people are, are sort of engaging in this sort of cutthroat kind of, of, um, of, of election. But now you have people who, the people who, are, who tend to be more successful in a ranked choice election aren't necessarily people who are moderate on the issues, but maybe people who are a little bit more moderate in, in sort of their temperament. Um, and so you have people who tend to be a little bit more interested in, in governing and a little bit more interested in, in talking about a wider swath of issues. So, you know, in Alaska, for example, uh, Mary Peltola, who was the Democrat who won that federal race, um, she ran making, you know, fish policy one of her major issues. Um, so she wasn't necessarily focusing on things that were, you know, hot button issues to, to get her base to, to turn out. Um, but she was really asking, well, what does the broader electorate uh, want to talk about? And so, and talked about some of those issues. And so I think that you've tended to see a little bit more of a focus on issues that have a broader uh, uh, interest to the electorate and people who maybe are a little bit more interested in governing once they actually get into office. I think it's interesting what you said about how it changes the tenor uh, of the the race. Because I, I was thinking back to the Republican primary in 2016, and Trump mm -hmm. was just vicious toward everybody. Right. But if, if in a ranked choice voting system, if he's that vicious, then maybe the people that are supporting the guys he's vicious towards, then they don't put him, you know, second or third on their list. So then he's incentivized to be more civil in, in the process. That's is that what you're saying? That's that's exactly it. And and of course, you know, it all depends on the preferences of the voters, right? I mean, voters ultimately may not care and they want someone who is, you know. Uh, overly aggressive or sort of trashing their their opponents. But because you have to get to 50 percent, um, unless you already have unless you're so popular that you already have 50 percent, um, you generally have to appeal to the supporters of your opponents as well, who might be saying, you know, well, you're not my favorite, but you're kind of competing for, you know, for their second or third place votes so that you ultimately can get to that majority. And so um, you know, we've seen this in other cases. I mean, in Virginia, for example, uh, Virginia had a convention where, uh, you know, uh, uh, Glenn Youngkin became the nominee and, as we know, ended up becoming elected the governor of of uh, Virginia, which has tended to trend in a more blue direction. Um, he won that election. He won the primary election on the first ballot. But, you know, you never know exactly what might have happened otherwise in, in a more traditional election because you, know, you could have had, you know, oppo research or, or people just kind of being much more aggressive that might not have, uh, have actually happened because of the fact that that candidates were incentivized to to act in a little bit different way. And so um, I think that there's you know, that, that's a significant benefit at a time where um, we oftentimes have candidates who are being overly adversarial in a way that's not necessarily driven by issue differences so much as just trying to to you know kind of tear down the opponents and and uh, creating a process where where sometimes um you know we have these primaries that are that are so contentious that candidates tear themselves down so that then they get into the general election and they've been beaten up so much in the in the primary that it disadvantages them in the general election as yeah. well and so uh, so I think, you know, again, I think that there are, there are a lot of levels of the ways in which civility can actually be, be in the interest of, uh, of parties or of candidates that otherwise won't happen in a, in a traditional first-past-the-post system. And what about third parties? Does this increase the chance that a third party could actually get some candidates elected? Does it decrease the chances or just not affect them at all? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that's one of those areas where we, we uh, admittedly probably don't have enough data, um, you know, uh, with a lot of these systems, right? I mean, people learn how to use them over time. And so, you know, I'm sort of in the camp where I don't really think that, uh, you know, it's not like because you have ranked choice voting that that tomorrow, uh, you know, third parties are suddenly going to be, be ruling the day. Uh, but I do think that, you know, elections take place over time and voters learn what the rules are. And I think that if you're a third party candidate, one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem that you face is that you're perceived uh, as being sort of unelectable, right? That the two major parties dominate the political scene and you sort of always have to be making the case that, well, even though, you know, you're, you're, you may like me better, um, you know, don't throw your vote away on the other guy, you know, throw it away on me, so to speak, right? That's, there's always that, that talk about throwing your vote away on yeah. a third party. Um, I think there's a case to be made that, Ranked choice voting, uh, while not perfect in this regard, 
uh, it does remove a lot of the incentive for voters to have to vote strategically. So for example, you know, a libertarian voter can say, or a libertarian minded Republican, for example, can say, actually, I really like that libertarian party candidate. I'm gonna vote for her as my first choice. I'm gonna still vote for the Republican as my second choice and the Democrat as my third, but because you provide that ranking, it's not like you're disadvantaging, you know, who you perceive as being more electable because of the fact that you're voting for the third party. And so I think that a lot of these election reforms are actually beneficial to third parties in that um, they provide a way for voters to to circumvent a lot of the ballot access rules and other things that kind of stack the deck about uh, about third parties in the first place. So it sounds good to me so far, but there are some critics out there and some criticisms and, and I'd just like to get you to respond to a few of them. It's sure. One is that it's going to lead to extremists getting elected. Another is that it's too expensive. And another is that it's too complicated. So can you address mm-hmm. each of those? Like what, what would be the, first of all, are they valid criticisms? Sure. Yeah. So it's funny, uh, you know, typically what you hear is that this argument that you're going to essentially elect uh, squishy centrists, right? That, uh, you know, moderates basically, because it's easier theoretically for a moderate to get a broader swath of the electorate uh, than it is someone who might be on on one of the fringes. Um, I don't find that argument particularly convincing because um, for a a point that I, I made earlier, which is that um, I don't think that you know, you're necessarily looking for candidates who are more moderate on the issues so much as ones who can demonstrate to voters that, that they're willing to actually govern and that they're more, I guess I would say, more moderate in in, um, in their temperament. And so and that's a very different thing. Right. I mean, I think about someone like, um, you know, Spencer Cox in Utah, as an example, who's who's quite conservative. He's not necessarily the most conservative, but he's uh, but he's he's he's, you know, I think uh, pretty far to the to the political right. But his temperament is different than a lot of people who are on on the right. Um, And so, you know, he he sort of has governed in that way. I think that in many ways, ranked choice voting helps to incentivize people like this, people who who know where they stand on the issues are willing and able to articulate uh, their their views on the issues to voters, but they're not just sort of beating up on voters for the point of, of you know, being a jerk. Um, and so I, I, I think that um, it, in my view, ranked choice voting uh, tends to incentivize people who have that kind of mindset, but not necessarily more moderate on, on the issues. Um, on the voter confusion question, uh, I don't really think there's a whole lot of evidence for that. You know, we have studied this at, at R Street. Um, you know, one of my colleagues wrote a paper on this and sort of looked at, um, you know, in the case of Alaska, for example, or in some of the, you know, we have an, another past paper we've done on on Maine. Um, and you just don't really find that this is that this is the case. I mean, you know, sure, I think anytime you present someone with something new, uh, you know, there's going to be some level of people who are, who are confused. Um, but the reality is that, I mean, Ranked choice voting doesn't really change anything if you don't want to. I mean, if you want to take a ballot and you want to vote for the candidate that you like best and then not rank anyone else, um, you're perfectly free to do so. And you're in you know, no different position than you otherwise uh, would have been. Um, what ranked choice voting does is it gives you this additional option uh, to be able to express further preferences besides who your who your number one preference is. And as a result, it essentially gives voters even more power um, to be able to impact the the, uh, eventual outcome of the election, even if their first choice uh, ends up being being eliminated. So um, so again, I think there's there's always a risk of, uh, you know, of confusion. But I mean, look, I mean, you know, voters in Australia, for example, have been using ranked choice voting for over 100 years to decide their elections. And I don't think that, you know, Australians are particularly more astute politically than than American voters. And and, you know, and to some degree, it's incumbent, I think, on, on candidates maybe to go and, um, you know, explain this to, to to their voters. But but in the cases where ranked choice voting has been used in the United States, which is you know, again, Maine and Alaska, but also the the gubernatorial race in Virginia. You know, we have the mayoral race in New York City. This, you know, it's been used uh, at the municipal level in, in you know, r- the red state of Utah for a, quite a while. We've had, you know, cities in California that have used it. There are, there are all these examples of people using these kinds of things and basically being able to, to understand how to do so. So um, I think the evidence is pretty weak there. Uh, and then I'm trying to remember what your third what your the third cost. It, it, one of the critiques I read is that it's going to be too expensive. 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting question here because um, so it, it depends a little bit on your perspective. So, you know, in, in Georgia, for example, um, you know, Georgia and, and some southern states have runoff elections. And as we saw, you know, in the in the recent you know Senate election, for example, um, you know, you didn't have a candidate who got to 50 percent of the uh, of the election that first round and then had to ultimately hold a, a runoff election a few weeks later. Uh, well, those runoff elections, first of all, are incredibly expensive um, because, you know, now you have to have candidates go and spend again. You have to have people come out to the polls one more time. Um, there's so there's there's a, a number of uh, things that you're essentially holding multiple elections. So in those southern states where you have runoffs, um, uh, you know, ranked choice voting can be a way to it. And the, the, the alternative name that is used is instant runoff voting, because in a sense, what you're able to do is kind of hold a runoff immediately because you know, you know what voters preferences are. And so so in those states, it actually saves a really substantial amount of money. Um, in other places, I mean, it's essentially a trade off. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, right now, I, I mean, there, there may be, a, you know, maybe the ballot is slightly longer and there's marginal printing costs or something like that. But um, but by and large, the cost is not really an issue there either. I mean, I think there may be a little bit on the margin, but um, but what you're really trading off with ranked choice voting um, is the ability, again, to have additional information from the voters so that you ultimately go and get candidates uh, who win to, to essentially have a majority. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, in those cases, again, that while there may be, you know, sometimes there may be the need, for example, to, to purchase updated, um, you know, voting machines, for example, that can handle uh, uh, ranked choice ballots. There are these sorts of things that can occur on the margin. Um, but I would say they're generally pretty small. Um, and as a voter myself, I would say I think it's more advantageous to have, you know, that that increased buy in and, and, and sort of uh, majority winners. Uh, that make that cost pretty much pretty much worth it. And 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 you may know, and some of your voters who, who are familiar with my work, you know, I'm a sort of a staunch fiscal conservative who has who has written about budget policy for a very long time. And so, uh, you know, this is one of those areas where uh, where I'm very much you know willing to go and say, yeah, you know, this is a case where where even if there are costs on the margin, it, it's it's probably worth it. So speaking of fiscal conservatives, the, the article that I read you was about how Republicans oppose generally ranked choice voting, but you think they should be for it. So why do they oppose it and why are they wrong? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's a pretty recent development that they that there has been some sort of organized opposition. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I, I don't really know that the arguments that have been presented are necessarily uh, what I would characterize as good faith arguments in many cases. Um, you know, I do think that there are legitimate uh, critiques of, of ranked choice voting that should be addressed, some of which you already asked me about. I mean, you know, the, the potential, for example, for voter confusion is a very legitimate concern that, like, we should study and determine whether or not that is something or the degree to which we should be caring about that. Um, I think that, you know, oftentimes what, what you've heard recently are sort of, um, you know, states and politicians kind of saying, uh, you know, oh, it's a plot from Democrats or from the left or so on, and uh, and sort of opposing it on these this sort of these these knee jerk grounds um, that I don't think really hold up to scrutiny. Um, I think that many many elected officials are they're comfortable with the status quo, right? They you know they they sort of see themselves I think as being experts on elections because they've been elected before. Uh, and so they're comfortable with the rules and oftentimes know that they've won based on, you know, under the current setup. So any change, whether it makes sense or not, um, you know, there's sort of, I think, this inherent, uh, you know, conservatism that that tends to creep in um, both from 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 both sides. Frankly, you get a ton of opposition from from Democrats and, and people on the left who, who don't want to see sort of the rules change either. Um, so. So that's kind of the, the, the source of the opposition. Like I said, I don't know that it's necessarily really well-founded. Um, my argument as to why Republicans should support it uh, is really, a, 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 I guess, a, a partisan you know, argument, which is to say that um, if you're, you know, if, if you look at what's happening to Republicans right now, uh, in many states, they're nominating candidates that can't get to 50%. So, you know, I mentioned Herschel Walker in Georgia. You can look at Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. You can look at candidates who have been nominated in, you know, uh, Arizona, Nevada, and so on. Um, and so what's happening is that candidates who might win in, you know, Alabama or, or, you know, Utah or Mississippi or more conservative states, 
can't necessarily win in states that are purple or, or you know, or light blue or light, even light red. And so as a result, uh, we're seeing Republicans who have been who've been losing a lot. Um, you know, not only did they lose the presidency in, in, in 2020, but, you know, they, they lost the Senate prior to that. They, they they ultimately regained the House after losing it, but by a margin that was smaller than was expected. Um, they've lost state houses that had previously been Republican hands for, in some cases, decades. Um, and I would argue that the, the reason that that's happening is because the, at the moment, the Republican primary process is nominating candidates who are most appealing to the subset of voters who are voting in those primaries, but they're not actually electable or broad have sort of broad appeal in the general election. And so uh, you're seeing Republicans essentially underperforming um, because they're nominating candidates that, again, I don't think it's necessarily are more extreme on the issues, but I think that they're they're just not appealing for one reason or another, right? I mean, in, in, in they're general. oddballs, right? They're, they're, yeah, they're and Herschel Walker's oddballs. a great example, right? I mean, Herschel Walker's a good example of this, right? I mean, I don't think that that you know he lost that race really because of the issues. I think he lost it because of all of these sort of other things that came out. Um, and so, so my argument in the piece that I wrote recently is that if you are a if you are someone who wants to see Republicans being competitive. In in you know purple and light blue and light red states, ranked choice voting actually offers you a mechanism by which you're more likely to nominate candidates that can win in general elections. Um, and you know, and I and I get pushback from you know uh, you get pushback from from Republicans, but also from Democrats on this point, right? Who who basically say, well, you know, they don't want to go and uh, and and see Republicans being competitive in these places. Um, but I would argue that you know the the for the, the benefit of the of the country, the benefit of the republic, um, it, it really is in our interest to have both parties nominating the best possible candidates who are sort of representing the broadest swath of the electorate. And, you know, right now, as we know, we're often being offered this choice between a far right Republican um, and and sort of a, a very far left progressive Democrat. Um, and, and oftentimes those people are not uh, are, are not ultimately representing the, the, the broad swath of the electorate. Um, and for what it's worth, if you're a Republican at the moment, for whatever reason, this seems to be a bigger problem on the right than it does on the left, where Democrats in many places have figured out ways to, to still nominate more moderate candidates in places where they can be competitive. And I think about people like Joe Manchin, for example, or, or Cinema and Senator Cinema in, in Arizona, right, who are, I think, closer to the median voter in those places. Than, than the candidates that Republicans have been able to nominate, and so, so my argument is that from a from a you know partisan standpoint, if you're the Republican National Committee, if you're the the NRCC, and you want to see you know candidates, uh, you want to see uh, uh, as many Republicans being elected to office as possible, um, you probably should look at ranked choice voting in places where where they're currently opposing it. Now, it seems to me that a lot of Republicans, especially the Trump base, have become very suspicious of elections. And it's not just obviously the, you know, the presidential election, but even like locally in my own state there, they don't like the uh, mail-in balloting, the early voting. They mm -hmm. think, you know, dead people are voting, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't really know much about it, but I do know mm -hmm. that there's a lot of concern about election integrity. So with ranked choice voting, would that increase the chances that you've got a secure election that everybody can sort of buy into, or is it just the same as it is now? Yeah, I think um, I, I think uh, it's it's um, well. So so first of all, I, I want to touch on one point what you said, which is that um, you know people are. I think that what's happening on the right is exactly what you described, which is that there's sort of this general suspicion of, of over um, you know about elections in general um, yeah. that it, you know I would argue is pretty unhealthy. But I think that um, you know changes like ranked choice voting um, are sort of being caught up in that. Uh, perhaps unfairly. So, you know, it, it's sort of like any change to the system is now being seen as sort of suspect. Um, and I think that's by and large what's going on is that is that concerns, uh, you know, whether they are, um, you know, whether they're they're uh, founded or not um, are, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, driving this sort of it, it, it's it's causing the, what you're talking about with respect to the feelings toward mail in voting or or ranked choice voting or primary reform efforts and so on. And so it's kind of seen as this, this altogether issue. 
Um, you know, look, I mean, I, I, you know, my argument is that I don't I don't think that there's, um, uh, you know, a whole lot of evidence, frankly, for for widespread, uh, you know, voter in, uh, voter integrity issues and, and, and security issues. Um, but I, I think that, you know, generally speaking, I mean, ranked choice voting provides you with a way to, um, again, like more closely uh, resemble what voters actually want to see. Um, and in that sense, like it's it's um, like it's beneficial, you know, sort of independent from from some of these other concerns, I think. And, and it, it makes it, a, I think, a, a largely a worthwhile reform. Um, so does it make elections uh, like safer or are there other things that we should be looking at? You know, no, there are probably other things that we should be talking about as well. But it's important to point out that these aren't, you know, um, it's not like because you want do one thing, you can't do another thing, right? Like these are in many ways separate issues. And so um, I think that people should think about the, um, uh, you know, the the, the benefits of, of, of RCV uh, independent from some of these other other concerns. Um, and, and, you know, and as I said earlier, I mean, there are other benefits here, like saving money, for example, right? Particularly in those runoff states. I mean, you know, the complaint you hear in Georgia, for example, all the time is that, uh, you know, they've got to hear ads for another month after after just having had, you know, a contentious primary election or, or general election. And so um, so, you know, again, there are other there are other benefits, I think, beyond just, you know, as something may relate to questions of election security. I noticed you called it RCV. Everything's got an acronym now. <laughs> can't you know I know. I'm always hesitant to go and uh, to go and use the use the and sometimes people call it IRV, um, be, you know, as I said, instant runoff voting, because it essentially provides you with a way to, um, uh, you know, to provide, uh, uh, you know, a runoff at, at all at once. So, yeah, there's all these kinds of uh, kinds of things that people use that are. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I hesitate to use it, but sometimes sometimes you, you got to not repeat. Uh, yourself. You, you might as well get into it, get 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 into the mix with the, the acronyms. I've been hearing about RCV now for, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. But why is it suddenly sort of coming into the news, into the atmosphere of, you know, what people are listening to or talking about? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a lot of it has to do with something you brought up earlier, which is just that, you know, election issues have become uh, more salient for lack of a better, uh, lack of better word. And so, um, because people are talking about things like mail-in voting or voter ID or a lot of these kinds of, you know, or threats to election workers and sort of all of the things that, that come into that, um, these issues have gone from basically being sort of an administrative, you know, question to now being caught up in the politics of the day. And so uh, I think, as again, that, you know, RCV or rank choice voting has, has largely been been sort of tied into that, right? Um, you know, you also, by the way, had redistricting happen very recently. So people in a lot of states were talking about, you know, gerrymandering, what the voting district might look like and, and, and so on. And so um, it's just been, I think, going back to the 2020 election, uh, very salient in general. And, uh, and so, you know, that's, um, I don't know, I think it is, again, it's just sort of been caught up in that, that broader uh, trajectory of, of election issues. Now, other than Alaska and Maine, where, where you mentioned, is it implemented anywhere else, if not at a, you know, a statewide letter, a level, maybe at a local level? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, Utah has used RCV for a good deal of time now, um, and, and voters there have generally liked it. I think that you know, a fair number of the election administrators uh, uh, like it. Uh, you know, some of them, I think, maybe had some of these questions about would it be confusing or would it be difficult to do from the standpoint of, you know, uh, running the election, but that really hasn't been a problem. Uh, so, you know, yeah, it's so it's sort of this idea that's popped up in many places. You know, Minneapolis, for example, is, is used it, right? And there, there's an effort in the state of Minnesota to think about whether or not they might want to use it statewide. So in many ways, it's kind of... Um, you know, it's sort of like the, the 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 mantra of federalism, right? Like it's kind of crept up in this sort of local local way um, where people have just sort of experimented with it. Um, and there are there are alternative versions that people have looked at too. You know, there's a a similar um, type of voting called approval voting, where instead of ranking your candidates, uh, you're basically able to go and pick more than one. So maybe there's four candidates on the ballot, and you happen to like two of them. Uh, then you can say, you know, I. I like the green and I like the Democrat or I like the libertarian and I like the Republican. And so it allows voters the ability to do that. 
Um, it's not necessarily, I think, as good as as ranked choice voting might be because there's sort of still this incentive to pick your choices more strategically. But um, but so these kinds of ideas, I think, have been out there for quite some time. Um, and, you know, they're, they're being put on the ballot. Generally speaking, voters are supportive. Um, I'll give you another good example. Um, uh, Nevada uh, in this last in, in November or, you know, last year. Uh, was considering a ballot initiative that would essentially um, implement an Alaska style system in, uh, in, in that state, which is not just ranked choice voting in the general, but it's something that's called final four voting, which essentially, um, instead of having two separate, you know, Republican and Democratic primaries, you just put everyone on the same primary ballot, and then you advance to the top four uh, to the general election, and then you let people vote via ranked choice voting in that general election. And what's interesting in, in the Nevada case is that um, it was sort of seen, there was huge opposition from both parties. Uh, you know, Republicans basically said Democrats are trying to go and take over our elections. Um, uh, on the flip side, on the on the left, you had, you know, unions coming out opposed because, you know, it might make it more difficult for them to go and, and, and engage with elections. And so you had really significant opposition from both sides. And I think no one gave it a chance to win. And it actually did win. Uh, and so now it will be very interesting because um, in Nevada, uh, you have to have a ballot initiative win in two consecutive election cycles. And so it will come up again in the next election. Um, and, uh, and, and so and then if it wins, then Nevada will essentially be the next state uh, to implement the same system that that Alaska did. And so it does seem like there is, um, you know, more and more uh, uh, just, you know, momentum for or trying out different systems. And, and, you know, I'm always sort of in the, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom camp, you know, that let, let different states and localities and municipalities and so on, um, try out what works for them, right? I mean, it might work in Alaska, but Alaska is a small state that's, you know, different than, than some of these bigger places. And so maybe there are issues that we haven't thought of, but uh, oftentimes the only way you're going to know for sure is if you let people experiment. And, and generally speaking in places where we've seen these experiments happening, uh, voters have have gotten acclimated to it very quickly and have generally expressed really high levels of satisfaction uh, with the voting process, uh, particularly as as compared to, you know, traditional uh, first past the post elections. What are the chances that uh, can you hear me? OK, yeah, I can hear you. Great. Oh, OK. It just came across my screen and said I was muted. Um, what are the chances that this thing actually picks up steam and becomes sort of a well-established method of voting throughout the country? Yeah, I mean, it's it's anyone's guess. I mean, I, um, I you know, I think that the more the more, you know, cities and localities and states that start to experiment, um, I think you're going to have more voters that are uh, uh, sort of you know, comfortable with voting in this way. Uh, and I think you'll have more elected officials who would become comfort comfortable in that way, right? Because you'll start to have elected officials who will be in office having won elections uh, when ranked choice has been utilized. So um, I, I think we're generally trending in that direction. And and for what it's worth, I, I should also add that um, just because many Republicans are sort of skeptical or maybe a little bit in opposition now, um, doesn't mean that that won't change very quickly. I mean, you know, President Trump, uh, you know, a few months ago now basically came out and said that Republicans should embrace mail-in voting. Uh, and as most political observers would, would, would know, you know, uh, Donald Trump was sort of the, the biggest opponent on, on the Republican side to mail-in voting. And you ask yourself, well, what changed? Well, I mean, he sort of realized that, you know, it's uh, in many ways that opposition, I think, is st stacking the deck against Republicans. I mean, you know, you have these elections where, you know, Democrats are able to go and get people to turn in their ballots ahead of time. And, and you have more time, essentially, to go and uh, shore up your vote. Republicans have been reliant on getting everyone to Election Day on one day, uh, which is a much more difficult logistical challenge. Um, and, you know, whether it can play a role, right? There's all these kind of factors. And so now you're starting to see people on the right, you know, Ronna McDaniel, for example, and, and Trump himself saying, mm, maybe we should rethink that right after we saw losses in Georgia and some of these other places. I think that it's very plausible that a similar phenomenon will happen with ranked choice voting where, where Republicans are, you know, their sort of instinct is to be opposed because it's a change from the status quo. But they're going to realize quickly that, um, you know, 
there are potential advantages to them embracing uh, ranked choice voting. And I think it may be plausible that we're going to sort of see that not necessarily everywhere, right? There are some states uh, that are, you know, pursuing bans on it and that, that may continue for the time being. But, um, but I, I, I think it's, uh, again, when you start looking at cases like Virginia, for example, which, you know, I think everyone had, had written off that a Republican could win in Virginia statewide uh, for quite some time. Um, and now they use ranked choice voting in their primary or in, in their convention. And, uh, and all of a sudden they end up winning the general election with a candidate that was more broadly appealing. So, uh, so again, anything can happen. I, you know, I'm not necessarily in the business of making political forecasts, but, um, but if you look at what's happened with re some related issues of late, um, it does seem like the, the political reality ultimately wins at the end of the day. And, and as I, you know, pointed out in, in my piece, I think that the, the political reality is that Republicans uh, would benefit pretty significantly if they if they embrace uh, ranked choice voting. All right. So is there anything that I forgot to ask? Anything else we should know about RCV before I let you get out of here? No, I think that's great. I think it's, um, you know, I think it's, uh, like I said, I'll just maybe reiterate one point I made, which is that, you know, look, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no right or wrong rule when it comes to how people vote, right? There are there are costs and benefits and things that make people make one thing maybe more attractive than the other. Uh, and, 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 you know, and so we, we obviously have to go and, and, and weigh those costs and benefits and make a determination. But, you know, I, I think that uh, I think that conservatives and, and Republicans generally um, have, have often talked a lot about the need to have power be devolved from the federal and sometimes even the state level down more locally. Um, I think we should allow localities and states to experiment with what they think is the best fit for them. Uh, and they may ultimately conclude that, you know, reforms like RCV are not most the most beneficial, uh, just like they make that determination with respect to other election reforms. But um, but the key is allowing that experimentation to happen. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and like I said, I think that the, the there's this other sort of elephant in the room, which is that you know, in some cases, by not allowing that experimentation to happen, it's not just problematic from like a, you know, political scientist kind of perspective, but even from their own sort of political uh, uh, standpoint, you know, fortune standpoint. And so, um, again, I think that I think that Republicans would be well served to explore ideas like RCV, RCV, both because of their their the political reality um, and also because of sort of their their stated ideological beliefs. Okay, Jonathan. So where can people find you? Yeah. So uh, as I said, I'm the director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Uh, so you can just go to R Street, uh, the letter R Street uh, dot org and uh, find out more about my work and the work of the governance program and uh, our entire uh, think tank. All right. Thank you very much for being here. And for now, I'm Michael Leibowitz, the Rational Egoist. We're signing off. Remember, like, comment, share, subscribe. Till next time. See ya.